be seated. I'm always taken by surprise with this hymnal whenever we sing that song. It leaves out the third verse. <laughs> but uh, this time I was looking and not singing the wrong verse. It's a, a delight and a privilege, of course, to have with us Brother Gary Johnson this morning. And he has requested that Brother Keith Coleman, who is being taken by surprise at this moment, come up and say a few words about the mission and about the work that Brother Johnson is doing. So, Brother Keith, if you would join us. Uh, of course, the Executive Director of the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions, and yesterday elected the President of the ICCC in Nash North America. And so, Brother Coleman, we're glad to have you with us. And uh, I know he's going to uh, get after Gary at this point, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Gary always has the last word on many of these things. But we're thankful how God has provided uh, through the years. I remember meeting Gary and Pat. Um, can't tell you what, what year it was. Um, we just come to Shelton College, and I think we had a missions conference probably. And uh, they were a very energetic couple. And they still remain very energetic. Uh, we lived with them when we lived over in Germantown at the uh, board headquarters, and uh, I learned a lot of of the horizontal practical mission work from from Gary and Pat, and I know my wife uh, also has, has learned a lot. But uh, our visits out to uh, Kenya, to their station and so forth, um, I found that which was practical in in regular life of uh, ministering the gospel to those who are around them. Uh, just not the preaching, or just not the distribution of materials and so forth, but it was an, in everyday contact bringing Christ to those who have yet to hear, and to those who were believers, a great opportunity to uh, to build them up and encourage them. And I think that's been a great testimony to God being able to use the talents that both Gary and Pat have, and we'll continue to, to use them. I can't see him uh, stopping, though, and that's kind of the problem. Maybe the Lord is, this is his thorn in the side. Well, this is his thorn in the foot um, that, uh, that will slow him down. But uh, God is blessed. And, you know, as we examine, this is our 78th year uh, at the Independent Board, that uh, the Lord has been pleased to use our missionaries. We're thankful for doors that open and close, uh, countries that have uh, been pleased to uh, be fruitful, uh, some doors closing and missionaries ushered out, uh, other doors opening up, and we're just so excited to see how these things have taken place. Uh, this past week, uh, one of our missionary couples, Stephen and Lydia Choi, uh, went to Singapore. Uh, they were notified that their daughter was about to die. She had gone through breast cancer for about a year and a half, and the Lord took her home uh, last Friday, and the funeral will be Tuesday. So we suffer along with that. We think there are somehow missionaries are invincible from uh, other things, uh, but they are too mothers and fathers, uh, parents to children, and, and uh, those are areas that we uh, comfort and, and encourage and pray for them also. So we thank you for your support for the missionaries under the board and uh, for your opportunities to have uh, Gary and, and Pat and others uh, through here that you are refreshed. Uh, and also for the uh, fine display that's back there, you're able to keep up with things. I trust you do. When a prayer letter comes, uh, read it if you would. Uh, there's a request in there, and you keep informed on what takes place. So we're thankful for that. Good to have the Executive Secretary, General Director of the Independent Board with us, and his dear wife was able to see there what work they had had in Philippines. That was just marvelous to be able to see many, many. Oh, we, we had this one, and we had this one here, and, and, and they were in Bible school, and this one has a camp now, and oh, that was just thrilling to be able to see that when we went to the ICC in the Philippines. I want to say thank you for having me. I want to say thanks for uh, so many that uh, I've known in the, in the past, and even from camp. It's so good to see them, and um, also to be here for a very special day with our good friends, the Whitbacks. And I thank the Lord for uh, 50 years together of serving the Lord, and what a privilege that is, and, and what privilege we have of, of sharing it with Him today. And so I trust that uh, uh, it will be a testimony both to us and also to their grandchildren. We had some of their grandchildren down at camp with us, and I was most impressed to see how they had developed 
in wanting to serve the Lord. And um, they have already, uh, I've already got a letter this year that uh, they're wanting to go out again. I think it's to the Indians, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, they're wanting to continue to serve. That's good. Uh, as I said today in Sunday school, it's not uh, that you become a missionary when you get abroad. No, you're a missionary here, and then if the Lord sees that you're faithful, then he will use you abroad. And, and I think this is very important, and I'm so glad to see some of them here today. I used to be never allowed to be in this pulpit. There was... One man that was a wonderful missionary, I don't know if he ever knew any language, but he certainly did blend in with the nationals around the world, and he was president of the International Council of Christian Churches. And so I sometimes I come into this pulpit in fear and trembling. I don't know if Keith feels that way, but I do. Uh, but I'm very grateful to Pastor for inviting, and, and um, even when I was delinquent in telling what my topic was going to be and what verses I was going to use, I was very sorry that I didn't get that into him ahead of time. But when you start getting ready to go abroad for six weeks, and you're trying to remember the bolts that holds the uh, winch on that would hope to get you out of a mud hole or the river uh, if the rains are coming, and we pray that they are, uh, sometimes there's some things you forget. I'm sure Elijah uh, never did have any problem like that, but boy, I sure do. But I am thrilled to death to be under the independent board for Presbyterian foreign years, and I think it's the 47th year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so... Uh, do I think that I will ever match uh, our dear brother down in Guatemala, the Rickers? No, no, I don't think I'll live that long, but that's okay. May the, the, every breath that I have resound in doing Jesus Christ, uh, the, in, in serving him. So today I want us to take our Bibles, as you already have, whenever Pastor uh, read in 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, and going from 17. And I don't want to be too long because we have some things that are coming up and, uh, and I want to be able to give good adequate time to that. I thank you all those who have come. I thank the new couples that I have not known before that you're here today and those that I've known long, long ago. Here we find in First Kings 18th chapter, and we're going to start, as we said, at 17. And I'm going to then switch back just a little bit from time to time, and I'm going to see about six things that uh, we found in Elijah. He was, a, he was a faithful missionary. He was a missionary that I would certainly like to pattern my life after. Um, I'm not sure that I want to sit by a brook even though I was able, and when I was living in the Holy Land, and uh, uh, Daryl Creamer, who's already gone to glory, he said, Gary, let's go down and follow Elijah all the way down to Jericho. And so I, I was able to do that. We went, we took a bus out of uh, first to Bethlehem into uh, Jerusalem, and then from Jerusalem we got on a bus, and we headed to Jericho. We got off, and we found the brook, and we went all the way down have no idea exactly what spot that uh, Elijah set, and he waited along the brook for the birds to come in each day to, to bring him food, faithfulness of the Lord, that he wasn't going to just put him out there and let him starve to death and, or make it on your own. We find that uh, Elijah had a teachable spirit, and every missionary and every pastor that I know, and, and we included, should have a teachable spirit that, that we can learn to sit at his feet and to learn even customs of, that may not be our own. It's customs so that we can um, learn to help us on to God. I, I know that when my sister was uh, failing very quickly uh, with liver cancer, and or, and or cirrhosis of the liver, and and um, I learned that um, uh, she uh, wanted to, to have a, a teachable spirit. And I said, 
O oh Lord, may I do your will each day. And uh, so, anyway, I called Keith Coleman up and I said, Keith, how could we honor a lady that has lived her whole life uh, since she accepted Jesus Christ in Ohio and up until now, how could we honor her? And he says, we'll just give a gift in honor of. And that's what we've been doing. And I'm happy to tell you that uh, Keith Coleman, uh, or that uh, Charlotte Fawcett, uh, has sent a card down and say, up to now, um, the, the funds that have come in to help the, the nationals who've not had any crops at all for 12, at least 12 months, $5,400 has come in for food. The board has already sent 3,000 of that, 2,000 for food and 1,000 for seed corn. And I'm so thrilled that, that there are times that come in, we don't do this very often. And I wasn't sure that it would even be acceptable. But it was, and, and I'm just thrilled to see uh, how the Africans have just, oh, this is from God's hands. We find that God told Elijah, he told him, I want you to go and tell the king that there is not going to be any rain for three years. You know, I don't know how that would bother you, whether that would get you or not, but I'll tell you what, if you went and told even our president that we're not going to have any rain at all for three years, uh, maybe up in Scranton and West Pittston area, they'd be thrilled to death that they weren't going to have any any floods, you know, for at least three years, you know. But then, uh, if you said that's going to go across the United States, uh, you can talk to Texas people down there, and they'll tell you how hard it's been when they just go just a, a, a few months without rain and the fires and things that come. I cannot imagine of how... The, the country must have been after three years without, how can you keep cattle? How can you keep a chicken? How can you keep anything at all? But this is what God told him, and then he, then he said, and you better, you better get to, get it out of Dodge. You better get someplace where you can hide. And we later know that, um, in this, that the king, Ahab, searched everywhere, everywhere he searched for Elijah. Probably wanting to reverse what God had said or, or do something or I'm going to kill you for making a prediction like this. But we found the submissiveness of Elijah. And this is what all of us missionaries and potential missionaries need is to be submissive with a teachable spirit. The next thing we find that uh, Elijah, he, sure enough, he did he did get out of Jerusalem. He did get away from the king. He did get a place where he could hide, and we found that he was stretched. Here you can I'm I'm just sure that Elijah had fairly good meals when he was in Elijah. I mean, after all, you know he he wasn't a, just a poor beggar. And but all of a sudden now the Lord is saying, I want you to go along a brook. I'll take care of you. Don't worry about that. And I will take care of you there. I have never known a missionary under our board or in, under any board that has ever gone hungry or starving. Oh, you may not have had all the different kind of foods you like to have. A pizza, I think we were talking about that in Sunday school. But I've never seen us lose too much weight uh, because we were serving on the field. I've seen some nationals lose some weight, but not die. And here we find that the Lord was going to stretch the faith of Elijah. That's not bad. That's not bad to say, am I willing as a missionary, am I willing as a servant of God, that I my faith can be stretched? I may not know where all of it is going to come in. And sometimes the hardest thing that I face sometimes is, Whenever I am told that, well, this church or another church is not going to, to give for one reason or another. Sometimes, one time I was told because I was moving from Africa to the Holy Land that they were going to stop my support. Another one, I was moving from the Holy Land back to, or to America and they, they stopped the support. And these things happen. 
And you know what? You have to say, Lord, that's, that's all right, even though it's not. Uh, that's all right that I know that I can still trust you and I can, I can my, have my faith stretched that even though I don't know where all my support is coming from, Board has ways of, you can write letters and visit and things like this to let people know what you're doing. And you'll see even in the thing that he prayed about today, about some of the missionaries, and, and I try not to have my name in there, but, uh, in there, but sometimes it can get in me if, if people start cutting by. But sometimes you have to have that faith stretched. And here we find Elijah sitting along a brook, and he is sitting there and he said, all right, and didn't have even have a reader's digest or nothing to read, you know, not much. And here we find that he's sitting there and then here comes this birdian with some food and things like that. Boy, I tell you what, that's, that's amazing that the Lord just sent that thing in there right. Probably he could have set his watch by it. Here it comes here, it comes in there. Are we willing to have our faith stretched here? And also on the field, and also that have our faith stretched, but also the, the people that we work with. What about that? Can we relay, can we say, well, you know, I don't have much, but here it is. One thing I learned that I don't understand a bit about is the Africans is that they cannot say no. If I go over to pastor's house or if I go to any of your houses, and I say, you know, I need a cup of sugar, or I need some flour, or I need whatever it might be. If you're in Africa, you cannot say no. No, if he has it, he has to give it. That's right. So I think, guess that's why they go to the store every day. So if they don't have it, they can't give it. And so, you know, boy, I tell you. But here we find that Elisha's sitting there. He had nobody to borrow from. He had nothing like this, but the Lord said, don't worry, Elijah, I'll take care of you. And I think that it's wonderful when we can depend upon the Lord that says, I want you to go to the king, and now I'm going to stretch your faith, and I'm going to, there's some other things we want to do. You remember that in, in the passage that he read, that after the brook dried up, and you can know it was going to, because, my goodness, you can't have no rain for three three years and have the, the rivers and the brooks and everything like this just keep flowing. That's not going to happen. Come out to Africa with me. I'll show you that it doesn't happen. Last time we had a, a terrible famine out there, uh, I was I saw a, the hole down in the middle of the river went 20 feet down. Up there where Judith Collins is, up in Bilal, uh, they said, uh, you can come, but I don't take any pictures because the guys that are dipping the, the water out don't have a lot of clothes on. And they're, they're forced, they're stacked for because the water is 40 feet underground along a riverbed. And so here we find that river dried up, which told uh, Elijah, okay, you better get out. You better, you better move on. I have other things that I want to teach you. And so we find that he, uh, he, he told Elijah, okay, now Elijah, you can leave now. Probably the birds quit coming and the brook dried up. And so now we find that he had to leave. And so he was even told to go to Zarephath. That is the hometown of where Jezebel came from. And you know, there's nothing in here that indicates, Lord, do you realize what you're telling me to do? You're telling me to go. They've been looking for me all over the place. And you know there will be people there in, in Zarephath that will be after me. No, no, he did not. He just accepted what God told him to do. Go to this town. He went into town. And as he came into the town, we find that, oh, naturally he's going to be thirsty. After all, this is, they had not had rain for a long time. And he's probably hungry because of the journey that he took. And here we find that he calls out to a lady that, that doesn't even know her name. And he said, ma'am, he said, would you mind getting me a drink? And, he, and so she... She looked up, and if you were from the Middle East, you would see that if somebody like that would ask you for 
something, oh, you would, you would want to comply with that. And by the way, as you go get me a drink, would you mind um, bringing me a little cake or something? Now, wait just a minute. You and I say, Elijah crossed the line. I mean, after all, he didn't know how, how she was taken care of. They hadn't been being able to grow any crops. Not just 12 months, but 36 months that he had, they had not had anything. And he's asking her, would you get me something? And she turns. Now, uh, <clears throat> by the way, you know, uh, well, I don't have anything. This is it. I'm just gathering up some things here. I have a son, and I want to get these up, and we're going to make a fire, and then we're going to die right here. That's it. I don't know about you, I don't know about a missionary out there, but if you were told this whenever you had made a request like Elijah had made, you would start backing up and you say, oh, well, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I don't know why I didn't think about that, you know. And oh, 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 goodness, how did I ever forget? But he didn't do that. He did not back up. He said, oh, that's all right. When she says, I, I just have a little bit of oil, that's olive oil, and I have just a little bit of, of meal. And then he says, go ahead, go on and make that cake and bring that that, you, that I ask you and make mine first. What would we do? I'll tell you what I think we Americans would do. We would say, I'm making it for my son. This only son I have. And I came out today, I've already thought about this, and I'm going to come out and I'm going to get these sticks and I'm going to cook this and that's it. Now, and if I've got any left over here, then I will make it for some stranger that just comes in, hey lady, would you make me something to eat? That's what, that's what we do. And probably we missionaries out there on the field would even do that. But she didn't do that. That lady had inside of her faith that was God-given. And every one of us want the people that we work with to have a God-given faith that if this is what the Lord tells me to do, no matter how inconvenienced I might be, no matter how... Oh, goodness, I'm not even sure I have that much in my account. I'm not sure uh, of, of a missionary that needs such and such. Well, what about my needs? No. I know in my heart this is what, I, what I'm supposed to do. I got a call this week from uh, Tipton, Iowa. They have good, very good friends in a church out there that supports us. We had a, had a man go out there with us. And he said, Gary, he said, uh, I want to just tell you something. He said, uh, boy, this week the Lord has really laid on my heart. And he said that he wants me to give a one-time gift. Now, it's a one-time gift now, he said. And he reminded me about three times that it was going to be a one-time gift. And it's not support. And he said, um, I want you to know that the Lord has laid it on my heart, but I don't know what it's for. I don't know if it's for food that you need. Uh, or if it's something else that you have on your heart. Well, I'd had a little talk with the Lord, kind of like, I don't feel like I'm the quality of Elijah, but we'd had a talk. And I said, Lord, I'm not going to tell the board, I'm not going to tell my wife, I'm not going to tell anybody. I need some funds because the last time we were out there, we put a foundation, 40 by 20 in, and... Um, that's in, and they've been making bricks, I understand. And I would certainly like to see this church to start to put up the walls, especially if they have the bricks and they're burnt. I'd really like to see these walls go up. But, Lord, I don't have a lot of funds, and, and I'm not going to ask anybody at all. I'm not going to do I'm just going to ask you. And so all of a sudden, the telephone rings, and the Lord had laid it on somebody. My dear ones... Some, we missionaries and others, many times we need to say, Lord, I know you are the ones that can meet my every need. I believe Elijah told the Lord this, and they had this good talking together. They didn't have a cell phone, or they didn't text nothing. They just talked to each other. I like talking a lot better than texting anyhow. Anyway, they, and they didn't have even, an, even a computer. You know, They didn't even have that. But here we find the Lord 
talk to him and he said, go on and ask her. And she's, and don't worry, I'll prepare her heart for what I want to do for her. And here we find that she obeyed Elijah and then we find that as, I, I would love to, I wouldn't even like to have been a, a, a spider or a mouse and seen her face as she poured that oil out. And they poured very carefully in the, in the Middle East. They, boy, they just don't go like that, like we do. No, no. They just pour very carefully and they mix around and stuff like that. Well, that's, that's good constriction. Yeah, I, I think I can, I can cook this now. And she looks down. Sure enough. I thought I, I thought I used all that oil. That meal that I, I had used, I was sure that this was going to be the last meal. That's going to be the best. And there's still, well, okay, good. I, I thought, I guess I misjudged there. And there we find that the, <clears throat> as she prepared and all, and she was able to take it out to Elijah, the servant of God, and she was able to give it. And he said, you know what? It won't run dry. It, the meal will not be finished. I'm the one that supplies the need. I'm the one that takes care of the missionary support. I'm the one that when you're on the field or whether you're not on the field or whether you're just here in the economic times that we have, I'm the one that takes care of your need. I'm the one that talks to the farmers in Iowa and says, go on and give that one-time gift. Because the missionary is going out and they need to build a church. That's right. That's it. And I'm sure every missionary that I know, and I'm sure probably every one of you in here, have had those times that you had that faith stretched. And you've had that time that, oh, I just don't know how I can go on. We find the next thing. And I think, as a medical person, that this would be one of the hardest things Elijah would face. And as I read even this morning, as I got up last night before I went to bed, and as I got up this morning, I read this place where one of the days that Elijah came and to the lady who was fixing his food and things like that, and she is upset, boy, I tell you, is she ever. I see some children here, all, all over the place here. And I'm sure that if all of a sudden one of them became so desperately sick that you, and especially the parents and the pastor and everybody, would be so very, very upset because this, this child is so very sick. And the lady said, you know, what, what have I done wrong? What is my sin? Is it something that I didn't, I've already forgotten about? And now you, my child is so sick? And he's barely breathing, and it didn't take very long that Elijah could see that the child died. And she's blaming. She's blaming Elijah. Why? I've tried to do for you as, as I felt God wanted me to. And now look what you have done. Oh, what did Elijah... You'll see here that... <clears throat> That he cried out unto the Lord. He did. Lord, how can you let this happen at a time whenever we hardly have anything to even eat? And now you're even testing me and her and the child and everyone around. You're testing us to the fullest. In fact, Lord, how could you take this child? But the Lord wasn't finished with Elijah. And here we find supplication. Here, Elijah really learns that to cry out to the Lord. And here we find, oh my goodness. Um, and so, here, in this thing, we, we find out that he cries out uh, to the Lord. And he, he, he just, and, and so, with this, he takes the child from the lady who was holding it. And he goes to, to the place where he is staying. And he lays the child in his own bed and he cries out, Oh God, oh God, please hear my prayer. Please hear me. Do something for this child. How can, how, they will, they will never trust you if this happens. 
And the Lord heard Elijah's prayer. And we find that, uh, that's in verse chapter 17. And he stretched himself, over 21, 17, 21, he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come unto him again. Boy, I have never had to do that on the field, but I've come awful close. I've never just taken and laid it on my bed, but tried to give the best medicine. I'll never forget one time I was sitting with one of the nationals, Benjamin Kamuti. Benj Kamuti was, was trained by Ms. McNeil, who was in this church, and also Dr. Johnson. He had good training. An African only had eighth grade education. Benjamin had come down to a Soviet to help us. And we were sitting there talking about days gone by and things. And all of a sudden, I saw Benjamin, at, you know, we were talking. And all of a sudden, he, he turned real fast. And it was like I was just talking to the wall. He jumped up. And the woman that, that they had just brought in to be examined, he went right to, to, to where she was. And he saw that her the eyes was rolling back into the head. She had gotten sick just that day. She had been yesterday in choir practice, and and yet this day she was. Her eyes are rolled back, and and they were, and everybody was shaking their head as if she had already died. Benjamin said, "Please bring her here into the the, the dental part," and he just started shoving things up and laid her down. And quickly they got a, a vein. Cholera had come so very very fast. I have. When Marilyn and us were out there on the field, we had seen cholera coming, and within just a few hours, that person was gone. We saw 14 go. And here, Benjamin had seen this before, and he came quickly and got that in there, and, 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 and got that thing, and started giving tetracycline so that she would uh, be responding from this, and, and she wouldn't have dehydration and things like this. My dear ones, I cannot, I, when I tell you this, just believe me, it happened. This was like at one o'clock. We had just got back from lunch and things like this. Do you know that day I took her home? She was, a, she said, why did you, I could hear, I could hear heaven singing. I was ready to go. She said, and here you stop me. I said, oh dear, we have to stop you because we weren't ready to turn loose of you. Elijah, I'm sure that's what he said about this boy that lay on that bed as he cried to God. And God heard his prayer and raised up that boy. And I'm sure Elijah was probably one of the happiest men ever alive to be able to take that child back up and give him to his mother. And the mother said, here it's even recorded, this I know that thou art a man of God. My goodness, all the other things that happened and, and I wonder about it. My goodness, here the, 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 the oil didn't dry up and the meal kept coming and all these things. But then, here because you gave me my son back. I know truly you're a man of God. You were tested. I was tested before, but now I saw you tested, and I saw you pass the test, Elijah. I know you truly are a man of God. My dear ones, I wonder, as people look at us, and they'll look at our faith, and how we react to different things, even the economy, even political things and all this. Can they truly say, I know this lady, I know this man is a man of God? I know by the way I saw them reacting in a very tough situation. Last week I was, uh, two weeks ago, I was over here at Haddonfield and I was talking about we probably have chosen one of the craziest times to go back to Africa. We have been praying and praying and asking the Lord to send rain, but boys, when rain comes, 
All of our churches, except one, is out in, in far, far away places. And, and one of the ones is, we have to go through two rivers. And I don't, and I'm talking about without bridges. And so you go through and, and boy, if you're not careful, you'll be washed away. Or if you get stuck in the middle and, and the rain comes, oh, the water comes so very fast and there goes your car. I've never had to tell the board that my car's gone yet. And so anyway, I, I was doing this, had some visitors from America, and I wanted to preach so very much in this one church. And so anyway, boy, I knew the water was kind of like this deep. Oh, Mr. Gary, you've got a four-wheel drive, you've got a Land Cruiser, four-wheel drive, naughty tires, you got a winch on the front, well, no problem at all. Well, that was okay until I got to the middle of the river and there was no underneath of it, it was just sand. Oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? And so anyway, I, I looked, and, and Pat was about as mad as a hornet, and why I even tried it, and, but I wanted to go. And so anyway, I got out and looked, and we had a little service on the bank, and there was no tractors around. And I hated to, to call, we have cell phones there, I hated to call the Muslims on Sunday to tell them to come and get me out of the middle of the river. But I was just about to do that, and after four and a half hours sitting there, a man comes up and said, Mr. Gary, he said, um, uh, would you be upset if I uh, got your car out of the middle of the river? Would I be upset? Not at all, guy. Go ahead. But all he had was a, a, a knife. You call it a machete. We call it a panga. All he had in his hand was that. And he's asking me if I'm going to be upset if he gets my car. What's he going? How's he going to do it with that little ponga? And I said no. And I sat back and I watched because I sure didn't know what to do. And I, I pulled the winch out, 100 foot winch. Well, I tell you, I had the best. Hip trees were further than 100 feet, so forget that. I tied ropes, just snapped them, just like nothing. Oh Lord, I don't know what to do. And here this man goes over and he starts cutting some trees that's not too far away and dragging them in. And I saw old and young alike dragging these branches and putting them there on the side. And then he started saying, okay, let's get them a little bit closer. Mr. Gary, please come and get inside the car, okay? So I get in this car and he's, and then all of a sudden he said, now hold on. Now I've never had too many people tell me to hold on sitting still. Up he they jerked that car, sitting up there like that, and he's cramming these branches under the tires. Okay, Mr. Gary, sit there now. We're going to do it the other way. Here comes the car again. Jammed him under this side. And, and oh, I was sure. I was sure I was going to be swimming just any minute, you know. And there I was. Now, he said, now start the car. And now the, the motor was not underwater. It was not. And here we find that, and, and, and I said, okay, now, now get, get out from back of me because I'm going to back up. And I don't want, I won't be able to see anybody back there. All right. And I heard the order given. And I put that thing in, in reverse. And boy, before I know it, Pastor, I was right there. I was just like, like he just picked me up and set me on the bank. I about loved that man to death. I really did. Elijah, I know exactly how it feels. I know that you'll get times when you cannot know what you're going to do next. And I'm sure that Elijah's doctoring ability was really tested to the nth degree that day. But there was God. And my dear friends, I don't know if you have tested and known about God the way that he wants you to know him. But he wants to, he wants to show you what he can do. He wanted, here Elijah had gone through so many things, but God still was testing Elijah so that he would learn to trust him more. Can we be trusted to, to, to pass the test and learn to trust him more? Well, she was glad to get him back. And then we find later on, when he went to the king, 
that he thought that, and he told the king, he told the king, I'm the only one that's standing. And they said, no, you're not. There, I've got many, many that have not bent the knee to Baal. I've got many. But we find another big test was coming that Elijah had to face, and that is the prophets of Baal. And boy, I'll tell you, they were very adamant. And here he said, first he thought he was the only one, and then he said, okay, you bring your prophets and I will have the prophets of, of Israel come here. And we all know that great story. I, I just took Keith Coleman out there this year. I said, Keith, I'm going to take you someplace we just have to go. No matter what, we're going to go to Mount Carmel. We're going to go where Elijah had the contest with the prophets of Baal. And I listen. This is the king versus king and the prophets of Baal versus Elijah and the prophets of God. Is he willing to trust the Lord all the way when a contest like this is going to come? Are we, are we willing to say, I am not going to compromise for anything? Oh, I tell you, wouldn't you like to have been there? I certainly would have. And there the prophets of Baal cried, slashed their self, jumped up and down. They did everything they possibly could. And no fire came. They had worked their self into a frenzy, frenzy, and if they had drugs, I'm good, sure they took every bit of them. But no fire came down. And finally, Elijah said, all right, stand back, everyone. Put the sacrifice there. And something happened. I want, to, I want just us believers to know. They rebuilt the altar with the 12 stones because of the 12 tribes. But for them to have to rebuild the altar, it meant that it had been neglected for a long time. And I'm sorry to say that sometimes we neglect the altar of God by doing this or our program over here or this and we forget to come back to the altar that God has given us. And he said, okay, now let's rebuild this up. Let's rebuild this, this altar. Okay, bring on, bring on the sacrifice, bring on the wood, these, these things like this. All right, now I want some water. Can you imagine after three years where in the world they would get water? I wondered this more than anything when I was out there in the Holy Land for six and a half years. Where are they going to get water? I showed Keith. I said, Keith, I want to show you something. One day I came up here, Pat and I came, and I went down and I just went to fields and I couldn't find any water. And I saw a man with some sheep and some goats. And I said, sir, I want to ask you a question, New Arabic. And so I asked him, and he said, cow, cow, come. Come. And I, so I, I drove real slow in my fiat and there followed this guy. And we walked to a, a like a cave. And there was a, a, a tree hanging out. Yalla, yalla, come here. He said, look under there. And sure enough, there was water. He said, I've never known that to dry up. Now, he didn't live back to the time of Elijah, but in all the times of dryness and things, up on a mountain, there it was. There was, a, there was this place where there was water. And Elijah said, bring on, bring on, just pour some, pour some barrels of water. On. I'll do it again. Come on. And, and they did it again. All right, let's, let's get one more. And they just filled that in and said that it ran all over the sacrifice and down on the rocks and, and down the edge and probably on the ground and everything. And then Elijah, who had been through those testing times before, he found that his standing, he was standing on the Word of God. He knew that the one that could raise that little boy up, the one that could take care of him by the brook, the one that could withhold the water, he knew he had a God in heaven. 
And this God would hear his prayer. My dear ones, I want to know today, you say you know the Lord. Whenever you pray, can you be sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that he hears your prayer? You've gone through some difficult times and you say, oh, that's all right, Lord. I know you're there. I know you've raised up this one. I know you've got me out of the middle of the river. I know all these things that have happened. And I know you're the same God. Bring down that fire. And boy, I'll tell you what. That thing that said that fire came down out. I remember there was no clouds. There was no clouds. Because he had to pray that in. And that came out of heaven. And that struck that. And it said it consumed both the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and everything. It said he did it. Because why? He's God. And he wanted to show those prophets of Baal that there is none beside him. My goodness, Elijah. No wonder Eli Elisha uh, wanted to learn from him. Because all these great things that he had gone through, he was a wonderful teacher. The fire that fell from heaven. The Lord, he is God. The Lord... He is God. Boy, I tell you, there's a lot more to this, but my time is gone. I think we can learn a lot from Elijah. I think we as missionaries getting ready to go back to the mission field, we have to remember all the great things that he taught Elijah, and they're not reserved just for him. They're ours too. That's right. And a lot of times we don't have them because we don't claim them. We don't say, Lord, now if you want me to go to camp, I know you can provide. I know you can. And if you don't want me, well, that's all right, Lord. Then you'll have something else for me to do. Oh, may I learn from his word that I can trust him fully and that whatever he says, he will do. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this passage that you have given. We may have even mentioned some of this before, but oh, it seems to be sweeter as the days go by. And Lord, as you're able to bring the fire down from heaven, I know that you can supply my needs and the Africans' needs and the board's needs and all the missionaries we have and the church's needs. I know that you can provide. Great is your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Challenging message. And each one of us needs to understand that God was using Elijah because Elijah had given his all to God. Elijah was a man of faith. A man who went through various tests and yet... What tremendous results. And I suspect that there are some young people out here, maybe some middle-aged people, that God has called full-time to the mission field. I'm praying for that. He may have spoken to your heart today, and you'll want to talk to Brother Johnson after the service. What can God do to use you, and to use you in a powerful way like Elijah? But you need to make sure that first you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, and that you've not just committed your life to him as a fire escape to get to heaven, but everything is on the altar. Elijah put the sacrifice on that altar and God consumed the whole thing. The sacrifice on the altar and the barrels of water and licked up the dust that was around the altar. 100% for him. We're going to stand and sing number 596, I Surrender All. And remember, as you sing these songs, you're singing words, you're communicating something. And I pray that you will mean it when you say, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Let's stand to sing. 596.
who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, the glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and ever. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Greet your neighbors. And uh, thank you for coming. You're invited to the uh, fellowship dinner in celebration of the 50th anniversary of Dick and Carol Whitbeck. What a joy that will be. Please join us for that over in the fellowship hall.